This channel is part of the History Hit Network. June 1930. Two men walk purposely through the Palace of Westminster. The man on the right of the picture is the most iconic British figure of the 20th century, Winston Churchill. The 29-year-old man on the left is the newly elected Member of Parliament for London's Paddington constituency. In the dark early days of World War II, with Norway and France falling and a German invasion seemingly only days away, Winston Churchill became Prime Minister of Great Britain. But he might never have become Prime Minister at all without this man, who was at Churchill's side celebrating his moment of triumph. In 1941, a desperate Winston Churchill asked for American aid to continue the war. It was this man, standing at his side, that brokered the deal. When the House of Commons was destroyed by German bombers in 1941, this man was by Churchill's side, surveying the damage. In the secret underground bunker from where Winston Churchill conducted the war, this man had his own room, right next door to Winston Churchill's. So who was this man? Forgotten now, his story was so unlikely it could be fiction, but it wasn't. By World War II, this man was one of the most influential and powerful men in Britain, yet he has completely disappeared from history. You have to look hard for his legacy because he ordered everything burned on his death and his ashes scattered. No graves, no worms, no epitaphs. This man's name was Brendan Bracken. brilliant political fixer and at that he was uh, made a brilliant contribution to Churchill's uh, survival let alone his career. Lord Longford who knew him said he was the most remarkable man he had ever met. He was shunned in certain circles he was seen as a turncoat he was seen as uh, anti-Irish uh, and in particular he was seen as a man who lost his faith. Says, well mystery man. My name is Adrian Bracken and I've always been fascinated by history. My own family history has it that Brendan Bracken was a cousin of my great-grandfather who emigrated to England from Ireland in the 1840s. Brendan Bracken became Winston Churchill's right-hand man for over 30 years, yet he was always a man of mystery, unmarried and secretive. I wanted to find out who this man really was, what drove him and and why the secrecy? What I found was one of the most inspirational stories I've ever heard. This is the story of Brendan Bracken, sometimes known as Churchill's secret son. Others had been there before me, notably Irishman Charles Edward Lysett's biography printed in the 1970s. So I went to Dublin to meet him and to hear his take on the Bracken story. I was, I suppose, of an Irish nationalist background and I felt it brought together two worlds in which I was interested, the world of his background, of Irish nationalism, and uh, the great Churchillian world, which of course had delivered us from the Nazi menace in the Second World War. Ironically, I think his memory survives more in Ireland than in England. Irish people, I think, have a great interest in him because he's the archetype of the Irish man who sheds his identity for advancement or to become part of the great social world of England. Our story doesn't start in the halls of power of Westminster, in the red seats of the House of Lords, in the great newspaper offices of Fleet Street. The story starts in a small town in the centre of Ireland, in Tipperary to be precise. Brendan Bracken was born here, in Church Street, Templemore, in the centre of Ireland, in February 1901, the third son of Joseph and Hannah Bracken. Joseph Bracken was a Republican, a staunch Fenian, a member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, 
And one of the seven men of Thurley's who in November 1884 started the Gaelic Athletic Association. And that promoted Irish sport, Irish culture and Irish language. The Bracken household was a working family, was relatively well off. Father Bracken, Joseph, had a mason's business. But cancer, the curse of the Bracken family, carried his father off in 1904 when Brendan was only three. If you love history, then you'll love History Hit. Our extensive library of documentary features everything from the ancient origins of our earliest ancestors to the daring mission to sink the Bismarck. History Hit has hundreds of exclusive documentaries with unrivaled access to the world's best historians. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial and Timeline fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. Brendan was very difficult in his school years. He, he bored easily, yet he excelled at English and history and maths, yet he regularly played truant from the O'Connell School here at Richmond Street in Dublin, run by the very strict Christian brothers who supported all things Irish, both nationalism and the language. And yet it became apparent in his school years that he got very quick wits, voracious reader and a prodigious memory. And one of his teachers, Brother William Allen, said he had brains to burn. Brendan Bracken, at 13 years old, used those brains to create his first newspaper business. He wrote about his school friends and masters, created the stories, coloured the pictures, but this wasn't for fun. Everybody paid one penny to read it, and that included his family. The young Bracken's business schemes moved up a gear when, for a fee, he would take in and look after other people's bicycles. What the trusting owners didn't know was that once they were safely out of sight, Brendan would hire those same bicycles out to somebody else for a further fee. The young Bracken realised very early on that deceit could be very profitable, even though it didn't endear himself to his fellow pupils. By early 1915, Bracken's troublemaking was becoming a serious problem. His constant truancy, his unpopularity with his school colleagues, and it must be said his teachers, caused his mother to be advised that a more disciplined school be found for Brandon. This was tantamount to expulsion. Exasperated, his family sent him here to Mungret College just outside Limerick, a strictly Jesuit boarding school where he lasted just five months in that spring of 1915. He played truant, he fought, he read incessantly, and yet he was unteachable. He got great wits and charm, he had great intelligence, he could charm the birds from the trees, said one past teacher. And yet one day he walked out of school at the age of 14, never to return. But it wasn't just the school he ran away from, he ran away from his family. Weeks passed, and how did his family eventually find him? He left a trail of unpaid hotel bills all over Southern Ireland, including a, a bill for a bowler hat and a suit in Limerick, where his mother tracked him down. He told her he'd been working as a reporter on a local paper. So dragged home to Dublin by his mother, he was packed off to a relative in Australia. Ha, oh, you'll like Australia, she said, it'll make a man of you. But was this the man the young Bracken wanted to be? Mother must have been a tough old bird because at 15 years of age, she sent him off to Australia. You know, and what mother does that? And I think, I'm not a psychologist, but I often wonder this sort of rejection by the mother fueled a lot of his energies. So, in 1916, young Bracken arrived in Melbourne, Australia. Brandon was dispatched to yet another distant cousin, this time on a New South Wales sheep farm in Echuca Moana. He begrudgingly worked on the farm, but spent all his spare time reading. He visited the local Brigidine nuns, where he managed to sweet-talk the mother superior, Sister Cecilia, into allowing him free reign of the convent library. And it was here, at Echuca, that Brendan Bracken developed his love of all things 18th century and English. 
He wanted to be part of the country houses, the Imperial Britain, to be part of the legacy of Burke, Walpole and the Duke of Marlborough, whose descendant, Winston Churchill, was the wartime First Lord of the Admiralty back in Britain. Instinctively, Bracken knew this was not something you earned, it was something you were born into. But this was not going to stop the young Bracken. He knew his particular talents of charm, lies and high intelligence would stand him in very good stead in 1920s England. He worked in and around Sydney to earn enough money to travel back to England to pay for the next part of the master plan. Arriving in Liverpool, legend has it he went out and accosted the first man he saw wearing a bowler hat and asked him the name of a good school. Sedba, he was told. So he decided there and then to break with his Irish roots and reinvented himself as Brendan Rendell Bracken after Montague Rendell, the then headmaster of one of England's greatest public schools, Winchester. He told them that his parents had died in a bushfire in Australia. They'd left him enough money for his education. And he told them that he was 16, not 19. But the plan, the great Bracken transition plan, started right here. The photographs exist of Brendan Bracken's time here at Sedra, but there is in the school records details of his admission in September 1920. And to show me is Katie Iliff, who's the school archivist. What have you got for me, Katie? Well, first of all, we've got the school admissions register, and as you can see here, we have an entry for Brendan Rendell Bracken, and this is in September 1920. Oh. He's given his date of birth at that point as the 14th of December. 1904 and also he's given his parent or guardian as B Bracken when we know that his father was Joseph. So in December 1920 Brendan Bracken left Sedborough School. After one term that he'd paid for himself he'd not told the truth about his age he was still supposed to be 16 when in fact he was 19 but Sedborough gave him what he really wanted and that was the old school tie. Twenty-year-old Brendan Bracken launched himself into 1920s England, the England that was still finding its feet from the hardships of World War I. Coupled with this were the troubles in his own land that had reached a critical mass with the civil war raging and atrocities on both sides. Not a good time to be a young Irishman from Republican roots. But Bracken had done a perfect job in becoming the quintessentially English gent. Now he's got his old school tie, the question was what to do with it. There were a succession of teaching jobs and finally he came here to Bishop Stortford College near London. So Brandon Bracken took a teaching job here at Bishop Stortford College as assistant master at Grimwade's house on £160 a year teaching 11 year olds. Fellow masters introduced Bracken to London society. Bracken started meeting social and political figures, all of whom were impressed by this lively Australian. And through these connections, he got an invitation to visit the House of Commons, the beating heart of Imperial Britain. And this first visit set in motion a chain of events that would change Brendan Bracken's life forever. Bracken saw his ultimate hero, the living embodiment of the 18th century England that Bracken so revered. And to Bracken's delight, he saw Winston Churchill demolish his critics who challenged him on his Middle Eastern policy. Bracken, having immersed himself in all the political comings and goings of the day, and with a sponge for a brain, was able to talk knowledgeably about all the latest hot political topics. But Churchill, he could only admire from afar. But at a dinner party one night with a group of Conservative MPs, Brendan Bracken was going to make a very important connection. Bracken's unqualified admiration for Churchill and his command of Middle Eastern politics so impressed his host that he introduced him to several of his parliamentary colleagues, one of whom 
Commander Oliver Locker Lampson invited him back to his house at North Street, Westminster to discuss a new magazine that he wanted Bracken to get involved in and it was called the Empire Review. Schoolmastering had served its purpose, time for a career change. Journalism, for which he'd always had a passion, was the obvious choice to propel him onwards and upwards. And Bracken moved off to the next stage of his very eventful life. Bracken was a master at making and remembering connections. Everybody was charmed by this tall, red-headed Australian who knew everybody and everything about everybody. Quite by chance, he met Douglas Jarrold, an editor at Air and Spottiswood, the King's Printers, a centuries-old firm who made a steady, if unexciting, income from printing the Bible and the prayer book. It was in the summer of 1922, through his job at the Empire Review, that Bracken was introduced to J. L. Garvin, the 40-year-old distinguished editor of the Observer newspaper. Garvin was a sensitive, romantic, immensely well-read personality who had an eye for young men of talent and promise. Garvin was taken with his brash, newly arrived firebrand with his flaming red hair and infectious personality. Bracken was learning firsthand the curious ways of the rich and the famous. What he lacked in social graces he made up for with a mixture of bluff, the usual lies and stories, and immense charm. Garvin proved the perfect mentor for a young man with a dreamy sense of history coupled with genuine political aspirations. Garvin and Bracken were both consumed with a passion for the past times of Walpole and Pitt and the Duke of Marlborough and spent many weekends with Garvin discussing the past and their hopes for the future. Bracken's months of networking bore fruit in the summer of 1923. A Sunday lunch invitation from his mentor J.L. Garvin provided Bracken with his passport to the inner circle. Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill was to be the guest of honour at Garvin's Beaconsfield house, and Bracken had been invited too. All those frustrating and rebellious Irish school years, all those lonely years in Australia dreaming of Regency Britain, now leapt from the pages of history. Here he was, face to face with the Duke of Marlborough's living descendant, born in Blenheim Palace, Winston Churchill was at his imperial best. But far from being tongue-tied and starstruck, Brendan Bracken seized the opportunity and brought all his charm and conversational skills into play. Bracken played it to perfection. Churchill was hooked. After lunch, Churchill asked Garvin point-blank. Who is this extraordinary young friend you've been hiding away? He strikes me as being very bright indeed. I should like to see him again. And later, Garvin pulled Bracken to one side and told him exactly what Churchill had said. Now Bracken realised he had his golden chance, turning his fantasy into fact. His path ahead was now clear, with Winston Churchill, the unknowing motive force of Brendan Bracken's ambitions. The 22-year-old Bracken wasted no time in telephoning and arranging a visit to Churchill's London home. The year before, in 1922, Churchill had lost his parliamentary seat of Dundee. Churchill was out in the cold. He'd famously said he was without an office, without a seat, and without a party. Bracken deeply resented the slight to what he considered to be his hero's honour. Like the faithful squire in an earlier chivalrous era, Bracken pledged himself to be at Churchill's disposal and with all Bracken's power to restore Churchill once more to high office. The vitality, the wit and the charisma of this red-headed Australian were just the tonic the jaded older man needed. There was, however, one obstacle. Mrs. Churchill. Clementine Churchill was Winston's wife of 20 years and was highly suspicious of Bracken's motives. She thought Brendan Bracken, a boy, half her husband's age, an interloper who'd appeared from nowhere, loud, brash and uncouth. And she warned Winston to be very cautious. Daddy called Clemmy by her, her first name he was, uh, almost as soon as he met her. Of course, she was quite formal and tended to put people in their place. So she wasn't best pleased with that. So the relationship got off to a very poor, poor start. <laughs> 
Bracken was fantasizing that he was now part of the Churchill family. He'd even stolen some Churchill family photographs and put them on his own Mayfair mantelpiece. No wonder London society tongue started wagging that Brendan was in fact Winston Churchill's illegitimate son. Clementine Churchill had to ask Winston if these stories that were the talk of London were true. Winston merely said, I checked the dates. They don't coincide. But in fact, neither Brendan Bracken nor Winston Churchill ever denied the rumour. He was part almost of the family life for many years. Sunday was Brendan Day. He came and showered them all with gifts. And of course, they all had the suspicion he was their father's child. That was the odd thing. They all grew up uh, wondering if this was so. And of course, later, Randolph, in his coarse way, used to call him my brother, the bastard. Churchill's great affection for Bracken offended Randolph, who, all, who felt that uh, Bracken was being treated as if he was his son and uh, he felt edged out and he several times he protests and says how hurt he is by the way um, uh, Churchill uh, places more reliance on Brendan Bracken than he would on him. Churchill was out in the cold politically but desperate to get back into Parliament. A December 1923 by-election gave Bracken the opportunity to prove his worth to Churchill. Churchill thought he saw a chance of winning the safe Labour stronghold of Leicester West. 23-year-old Bracken, who'd only known Winston Churchill for four months, appointed himself Churchill's personal assistant and worked night and day for the Churchill campaign in this almost unwinnable seat. Churchill, with Bracken's help, fought two elections at Leicester West and Westminster Abbey as an independent, but he lost them both. Despite these setbacks, Bracken could always lift his friend from the black dog depression that plagued Churchill all his life. New Conservative leader Stanley Baldwin gave Winston the safe Conservative seat of Epping, which Winston won in the landslide of 1924, and Winston became Chancellor of the Exchequer. Bracken wrote to his mother, whom he'd now forgiven for exiling him to Australia, Dearest Mama, I shall never be so happy as I was last week. Dear Winston became Chancellor after two years of enforced absence from Parliament and after a campaign of misrepresentation and abuse that seemed to blight his hopes and chances for a very long time. He, he idealised his mother. Like why, I don't know, but something obviously in his psyche, he transferred his, 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 his affection or his love uh, to his mother and idealised her in a way that's, that's quite strange really, given, you know, given, given what she'd done. Winston Churchill, as a government minister, now had an army of secretaries and civil servants at his side. 23-year-old Brendan Bracken had become redundant, but the success of his hero had left Bracken with a burning desire to join his idol and sit side by side with him in the Mother of Parliaments but Bracken knew that that was going to take influence and money. So Bracken threw himself into his job at the publishing business of Eyre and Spottiswood. He wasn't to everybody's taste at this sleepy old firm off London's Fleet Street, but Bracken proved his worth by quickly increasing titles, circulation and profits for the company. Bracken took the business by the throat. He renamed the Empire Review English Life. He commissioned articles from everybody, including Churchill, and even controversial figures like Italian fascist dictator Benito Mussolini. In giving people what they wanted to read, Bracken was turning the Bible printer into a dynamic publishing house. His success was soon recognized with the directorship, but he was still only 24 years old. In 1925, Bracken's sharp business brain saw an opportunity in an area vital to Britain's trade. The banking community had long been without an independent voice, and in January 1926, The Banker was born. Still a major magazine with a worldwide circulation, Brian Kaplan as the current editor. But undoubtedly, he was the founder of modern financial journalism. He's the guy who really kind of put this style of journalism 
that you go out and investigate companies properly and banks properly and you have a financial debate, he put that on the map, you know, and it's something we've been doing for the 83 years since the banker was founded. Never forgetting his ambition to join Winston Churchill in Parliament, he persuaded Eyre and Spottiswood to buy a half share in 80-year-old respected financial magazine, The Economist, the other half being owned by South African mining magnate Sir Henry Strakosch. In 1928 came the Investor's Chronicle, The Practitioner, and after a tip that it was for sale, The Financial News, with a smaller circulation to the rival pink-coloured Financial Times. In the pre-Wall Street crash bull market, shares and profits, like Bracken's social standing, were only going one way, upwards. Relationships between Brendan Bracken and Winston Churchill in this period, 1925 to 1929, were reported to have been strained. The truth, I think, was that in this period, Bracken was very much involved in his business and Churchill was Chancellor of the Exchequer. Bracken made a great deal of money in this period. Nobody's quite sure how he made so much wealth so quickly, but it was enough to set up home here in North Street, Westminster. Now the name, North Street, wasn't grand enough for Brendan Bracken. So he had it changed to Lord North Street, as befitted his gravitas and his huge ego. He also employed James and Beatrice Costello as butler and housekeeper. And during dinner parties, James Costello was primed to announce, Mr. Bracken, the Prime Minister is on the telephone for you. He also purchased a large Hispano Suiza motor car and employed Alex Ailey, who was Churchill's old chauffeur. And these three members of staff were with him for over 30 years, indeed they all outlived him. And to complete his collection, he purchased a large country house in Woburn in Bedfordshire. By late 1928, and still in his 20s, Bracken called in all his business and political favours. He was going to use his wealth to make his mark politically. He'd more than enough money to support a parliamentary campaign, and he was offered the marginal Conservative seat of Paddington in North London though he was still a man of mystery to most people, even to those in his own party. The May 1929 election was a tough and dirty campaign. Bracken even at one point having to deny that he was a Polish Jew, Jewish immigration being a real issue in late 1920s England. Bracken's aura of mystery worked against him for once, and he was forced to send to Ireland for his birth certificate but the real truth about his Republican upbringing, Bracken still kept very close to his chest. Bracken narrowly won the seat by only 500 votes, but here was his chance to sit alongside his idol. The Labour Party had won the general election, so he and Churchill were finally sitting knee to knee in Parliament, but in opposition. Immediately, Churchill, now a front-bench spokesman, created trouble for himself by opposing Conservative leader Baldwin's policy of granting India, Britain's imperial jewel, home rule. Churchill resigned the front bench in protest, and Bracken allied himself with Churchill, and both were in the political wilderness for the next ten years. The 1931 general election was held in the middle of the Great Depression. Baldwin's Conservatives won a landslide victory. Brendan Bracken now found himself in government and alongside his hero Winston Churchill. But there was a serious problem. Churchill was still opposed to the conservative policy of home rule for India. Churchill was adamant that India, the jewel of the British Empire, should stay firmly under British rule and that Gandhi was a dangerous agitator that would lead the Indian people into nothing but trouble. Bracken stood four square beside Churchill whatever the political or personal cost to himself. But there was another more dangerous cloud forming on the horizon. This time, much closer to home, the emergence of Adolf Hitler in Germany. The 1930s for Bracken, now a member of parliament, a successful businessman with a wealth of social connections, were full of parties and nightclubs and country houses. Time for a wife. But not just any wife would suit our red-headed fantasist. He needed a trophy wife. At a friend's house, Brendan Bracken saw a potential Mrs. Bracken. Ten years younger than he was, Penelope Dudley Ward was a 22-year-old aspiring actress and the daughter of Frieda Dudley Ward, reputedly the mistress of the Prince of Wales. <laughs> 
Penelope grew fond of Brendan Bracken, but couldn't understand why he couldn't relax and be at ease with himself when alone with her. If he loved her, she thought, he had a very peculiar way of showing it. Penelope had no intention of giving herself to a contrary friend whose inner self was firmly locked up and never to be revealed. Penelope's mother, Frida, later said that no man could have been more generous or thoughtful to my daughter. But perhaps he was pathetically shy or felt he was ugly or inadequate, but never once did he offer the slightest gesture of affection to Penelope. Although Bracken claimed her refusal of his proposal of marriage was the reason he never later married, Penelope claimed that he never actually proposed at all. He had a fear. He was nervous, apparently, of young, nubile women. Uh, <laughs> he was far more comfortable with their mothers. <laughs> but uh, he was, I think he was like an Irish celibate, for, for want of a better word. He, he didn't, uh, he had a few high society lady friends in the 30s, but I often wonder, was that just show, just it was part of the apparatus, part of the successful man, the politician, the publisher, and you'd have a, you'd have a lady in tow. Whatever the truth, this was the last time that any woman ever featured in Brendan Bracken's private life. His close friends remained male. In the spring of 1935, Hitler was rearming. Churchill, with Bracken's support, warned endlessly about the gathering storm, as he called it. In March 1936, Hitler took back the Rhineland in contravention of the Versailles Treaty of 1919 that had ended the First World War. The European war drums were beating for the second time in a generation. The improving economy, however, meant that the public had no taste for warmongers, and no one in Parliament took either Bracken, regarded as a playboy of no account, or Churchill, who was finished, seriously. Bracken, in particular, was the court jester and the ventriloquist dummy, and was a blowhard without a past and without a future. They stood alone, Bracken and Churchill, like a party of two, quarrelling incessantly like a happily married couple. In November 1935, Hitler's fascist ally, Italian dictator Mussolini, invaded Abyssinia, and now Ethiopia, and suddenly people took notice of Churchill's warnings. Bracken worked hard gathering conservative support for Churchill, and Bracken's house at Lord North Street became the headquarters of the anti-appeasement lobby. I think that among the, uh, the, the networkers and spin doctors that I've known, that he was probably the best. Uh, he had a broad range of, uh, of, of contacts. Uh, he had a natural ability to make friends. Uh, and uh, this came from natural warmth of character, I think. Um, he did uh, have a very good understanding of the more conspiratorial side of politics. And that played a large, uh, a very helpful role when uh, the appeasers were continually conspiring to get rid of Churchill. As 1936 became 1937, the German threat grew ever stronger, just as Churchill had predicted. Public opinion, though derided by Bracken as a lot of butter-slapping grocers, was to keep the peace at any cost. But public attention was taken with the Edward and Mrs. Simpson affair and the subsequent abdication. In May 1937, Stanley Baldwin resigned and Neville Chamberlain became Prime Minister. Seen as a peacemaker, it was hoped that Chamberlain could divert the path from certain war to peace. Bracken's acid tongue announced that the ironmonger, Baldwin, had given way to the coroner, Chamberlain. Neither he nor Churchill were impressed with either. But Churchill, as well as warning of Hitler's danger, found another, more personal problem right on his doorstep. Churchill, never good with money anyway, was now reduced to a meagre backbencher's salary, all of which, and more, he was putting into his large country house, Chartwell, deep in the English countryside that he'd bought in 1922. Churchill was not good at his personal finances and was reluctant to change his lifestyle. 
Uh, and uh, I think that uh, Bracken would have been the advi advisor who kept him out of financial trouble. Bracken was always involved in Churchill's fin finances. His great early service was to sell Churchill's articles. A lot of Churchill's income came through articles and books. Bracken arranged for Churchill to write for his papers and for his magazines, and he placed and commissioned articles. But Churchill was still short of funds, so Bracken arranged secretly to help Churchill financially. In 1938, things came to a head when Churchill put his beloved Chartwell on the market. Brendan Bracken knew that he had to act. He did what he did best. He secretly fixed and arranged. And with Sir Henry Strakosch, with whom he bought The Economist, he created the Churchill Fund. Strakosch himself paid off Churchill's stockbroking debt, which was around £18,000, almost as much as Chartwell was worth. War with Germany was seen as inevitable. Both sides of the Atlantic could see the situation in Europe was going towards war. And Churchill was perceived as the only person who realistically could lead a wartime Britain. But Churchill couldn't do that if he was bankrupt. All through 1939, the preparations for war were everywhere in Europe. Men were mobilized, defenses dug, country houses boarded up, armies readied. And in September 1939, Hitler invaded Poland and Europe was at war once again. Bracken felt instinctively that Churchill's hour had come and Bracken was gonna make sure that this Churchill, his Churchill, took his place in history as his predecessor, John Churchill, the Duke of Marlborough had done 200 years before. Prime Minister Chamberlain quickly appointed his advisers to help him fight the Nazi threat. Winston's back was the message telegraphed around the fleet as Churchill was again appointed First Lord of the Admiralty in the War Cabinet, and Brendan Bracken became his parliamentary private secretary. This job was made for Bracken. His natural talents for scheming and lies were now put to use with all his business, political and social contacts. Bracken was now the terrier at Bulldog Churchill's kennel door. Brendan Bracken, along with Lord Meaverbrook, now the Minister of Aircraft Production, were the men who saw Churchill after midnight, the close advisers and friends who supported Churchill day and night. But the defining moment in the Bracken-Churchill relationship came in 1940. Britain's war was not going well. Years of underinvestment in Britain's armed forces, just as Churchill had in fact predicted, ultimately would lead to the evacuation of Dunkirk, the loss of France and the fall of Norway. Britain stood alone in Europe. The Conservative Party lost the support of the Labour Party, who wanted a national government, and absolutely to refuse to work one day more with Neville Chamberlain as Prime Minister. The Conservatives met in secret to elect a successor. Lord Halifax, the Foreign Secretary, was the obvious next choice as Prime Minister. Churchill was likely to support Halifax's election. But in Bracken's great moment of power broking, and with his ever-sensitive antenna, he knew that this was Winston Churchill's moment, if he played it correctly. Bracken told Churchill that if Halifax were proposed as Prime Minister and they asked for Churchill's support, Churchill had to promise Bracken to remain silent. Churchill promised, and when in the meeting it was proposed that Halifax become Prime Minister, they looked at Churchill, who kept his mouth firmly shut. There then began what was later known as the Great Silence that saved England. It lasted a full two minutes. And at the end of the two minutes, Lord Halifax said he, he felt he could not be an efficient Prime Minister from the House of Lords. The meeting looked to Churchill, and he accepted. So on the 10th of May 1940, Winston Churchill became Prime Minister of Great Britain. The great fantasist, Brendan Bracken, from his roots in Republican Ireland, through dubious and highly coloured stories of his background, 
and his unique relationship with Churchill. Now had become the power broker, and quite possibly the second most powerful man in England after Churchill himself. Britain's war was running short of supplies, and so she turned to the old ally America for help. Brendan Bracken had been to America in 1937 and had met many influential Americans, including Harry Hopkins, who was President Roosevelt's right-hand man. So when in 1941, Harry Hopkins was sent by Roosevelt to assess Britain's prospects and whether the USA should help Britain, it was his old friend, Brendan Bracken, who met Harry Hopkins on his arrival in Southern England. Hopkins immediately sounded Bracken out. Are you going to let Hitler take over these fields, he asked Bracken, and with the full weight of Winston Churchill behind him, answered no. Hopkins' handwritten letter to the President of January 1941 dismissed the Foreign Secretary Sir Anthony Eden as a man of little importance. It was really Bracken and Churchill that persuaded Roosevelt to give them the much-needed supplies to continue the war. I'm sure that Hitler cannot defeat the British people. The British are determined to win. They need our help. They're depending on our help. They deserve to get it. They are great people. And I'm sure they're going to win. And without these supplies, Britain could not have continued the war. Britain was no longer alone. By 1941, Britain's cities were cowering under constant bombardment from Hitler's Luftwaffe. But there was another aerial battle going on, the Battle of the Air Waves, the Information War. The war among Churchill only wages this war against the German people to save the British Empire. You are tuned to the General Overseas Service of the BBC. Bracken had always turned down a government post, preferring to stay firmly at his master Churchill's side. But Churchill needed an expert to counter the Nazi propaganda machine. Bracken was his man. The Ministry of Information was the central government department that covered publicity, propaganda, censorship, press relations and broadcasting. From 1939 it had struggled under a succession of ineffective ministers. and Brendan Bracken took that government post that he'd so long resisted as Churchill's Minister of Information. His 1941 press conference on taking up his post is one of the very rare films of Brendan Bracken speaking publicly. I was uh, conscripted here, uh, I don't know for what reason, uh, perhaps there's one reason, and th that is I am myself a pressman. And I understand the duty of a press minister to dish out the news. And uh, I know exactly the amount of faithful and splendid work done in this building by the members of the journalistic profession. I come to you there, therefore, as a colleague, absolutely. I'm a pressman, I'm interested in news. And if I can't get any news into the papers, well, the sooner that I depart from these premises, the better for you all and the better for the country. Brendan Bracken's office was here in the cabinet war rooms below London's Whitehall. His desk is still here, his bed is still here, his personal effects, and it was from here that he was able to act as mentor and go-between for Winston Churchill. Uniquely because he'd worked for Churchill for so many years through the good and the bad times, he was the prop upon which Winston Churchill so often relied. But there was one area where Bracken and Churchill differed, and that was the role of the British Broadcasting Corporation 
the BBC. In the 1930s, Churchill had been refused airtime to warn of the Nazis' upcoming threat. Many people believe that the BBC was a branch of government. The BBC was, and still is, an organisation that fiercely guards its independence from government interference. The BBC governors were very apprehensive because they knew that Churchill wanted to take over the BBC in 1940. He'd accused them of unrelieved pessimism and called them the enemy within the gates. Churchill was still wary of the BBC, but Brendan Bracken, as a pressman, believed that a free country needed a free press. He persuaded Churchill not to follow the German example of constant government propaganda, but to allow him as an information minister to advise on rather than control what was broadcast. Bracken knew he was treading a thin line between censorship and freedom of information, but Churchill once again trusted his old friend's judgment and left the BBC's future in Bracken's hands. And to this day, the BBC owes a huge vote of thanks to Brendan Bracken for their independence from government. As Minister of Information, Brendan Bracken was in charge of giving his fellow newsmen the stories they wanted, just as he promised on the day of his appointment. He employed several leading writers of the day, including Eric Blair, who later, as George Orwell, satirised his time there in the novel 1984. Brendan Bracken, or BB as he was known around the ministry, along with Churchill, believed the truth was so important that it must be protected by a bodyguard of lies, became Big Brother, and along with Room 101 and the Ministry of Truth, have all passed into modern English language. In 1945, the war in Europe had been won. Bracken had seen his hero through the dark times, the financial crises, the derision of the 1930s, and seen him, with his help, become one of England's most iconic men. Brendan Bracken felt he had played his part in history because his Churchill, Winston Churchill, had surpassed his ancestor, John Churchill, the Duke of Marlborough. His hero's place in history was assured. His work as Minister of Information was done. So Winston Churchill, in the post-victory government, gave Brendan Bracken the job Churchill had twice held himself, that of First Lord of the Admiralty. In the July 1945 election, Churchill prepared to be a peacetime Prime Minister. But in an unexpected turnaround, Labour was given a massive overall majority. Churchill was out as Prime Minister Clement Attlee was the new man in Downing Street, and Bracken even lost his own Paddington parliamentary seat. Winston Churchill turned to his family for support. For Brendan Bracken, Parliament had been his family for nearly 20 years, but the pre-war Bracken, the fantasist, the fighter for Churchill's honour, had now mellowed. In 1946, the older, more mature Bracken, but still only 45 years old, stood for Parliament again, but this time for Bournemouth on England's south coast. Now Bracken saw himself as a man of the people, and all the energy and drive that had put Churchill into power were now directed towards his new voters. He'd missed helping constituents during the frantic war years. Now he had a chance in a time of peace to represent and help ordinary people with whom he felt a great affinity. Perhaps he felt deep down a need to redeem his soul, which he felt he'd mortgaged to realise those boyhood dreams of the grand life in Imperial England. His old school, Sedba, where the one term spent in 1920 had given him his passport, the old school tie, had made him chairman of the Board of Governors and now received a new library, but typically of Bracken, it was dedicated to Winston Churchill. Remember Winston Churchill, it says, over the door. He regularly attended governors' meetings and the late Michael Thornley, headmaster in the 1950s, knew him well. Occasionally, I'm told that he had to face the fact that somebody in his employ, not here, but whatever paper or something, you know, was uh, not pulling his weight and had to be sacked. Uh, but Brendan would go to the most extraordinary extremes to uh, 
you always get somebody to wield the axe and he himself in the background would be working away to see how he could find another job for that chap without telling him of course. So the man, the victim, <laughs> usually ended up very bewildered and quite un incapable of telling whether he'd been sacked or promoted. <laughs> <laughs> Bracken, unmarried with no close family of his own, had spent most of his life denying his Irish past and his own family. He only came back to Ireland twice. Once in 1928, he came to bury his mother here at the pretty cemetery at Glen Keane in Boris Lee. But he was too late for the funeral mass. He came from London to Dublin by boat and from Dublin straight here by taxi. And he stood over there, tears streaming down his face while his family buried his mother just here. Without a word to his family, he got back into the taxi, back to Dublin and back to London. The family remember him with great affection. The family remember him who, uh, a man who kept his distance but kept in touch. A man who uh, looked after his family in, in times when, when help was needed. Um, in terms of uh, he educated all of us. He did by his family, but right by his family. And the second time was in 1943 on the way to the Canada Conference. Bracken's flying boat had put into Limerick for repairs and they were grounded for two days. Come on, let me show you where I was born, he said, where I grew up. And he took his colleagues, including Sir Anthony Eden, on a tour of the local area, Templemore, Limerick. But the great irony was that he was such a compulsive liar that his colleagues never actually believed this one true story when Bracken told them. Bracken now turned his attention to the only things that he had left, his businesses, and specifically his newspapers. So in this period, after the war, paper was short, it was austerity, but they were profitable. Bracken managed to merge his paper, the Financial News, with its pink competitor, the Financial Times. I spoke to Financial Times historian David Kinniston and asked him about the merger. Well, I think he was one of the makers of the modern Financial Times that has become one of the, in, in the last 20 or 30 years, one of the world's great newspapers. And uh, specifically in the sense that uh, in 1945, at the end of the war, it still was essentially a city newspaper, relatively small circulation, relatively narrow focus. And under Bracken, of course other people were involved, but nevertheless Bracken as the guiding light, uh, the paper transformed itself into one that looked at a much wider, had a much wider remit, looking at Britain as a whole, uh, industry as a whole, in, of interest to policymakers, in, influential people and so on. And then subsequently in the 1960s, after, after Bracken's death, uh, took on an international dimension uh, and became something like the, 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 the modern FT that we now recognise. But I think Bracken's influence in that was, was considerable. The 30 share index became the FTSE 100 and to this day is the definitive measure of share performance and has been successfully copied around the world. Now printed worldwide, the Irish edition of the Financial Times today, ironically, is printed in Burr, not 20 miles from Temple Moor, where Bracken was born. Brandon Bracken started one more niche publication, History Today, the title suggested by Winston Churchill himself. History Today launched in 1951 and has always drawn together the best and latest history writers ever since. Over 60 years later, History Today still thrives. In the spring of 1958, Bracken was diagnosed with terminal throat cancer, years of cigarette smoking having its inevitable result. But on the 8th of August 1958, Brendan Bracken died. He was 57 years old. When Churchill learned of Bracken's death in the south of France, great tears welled up in Churchill's eyes and poured down the old man's face. Poor dear Brendan, he said. But he was too ill to attend the funeral, dying himself seven years later at the age of 90. 
Clementine Churchill, Winston's wife, had now forgiven the red-headed journalist who used to sleep on her sofa with his boots on. Indeed, she came to appreciate all that Brendan Bracken had done for her husband. She sometimes thought that Winston had not appreciated him fully. During the war, like many other people, uh, in he, she came round to him because he saw that his, he wasn't self-seeking where Churchill was concerned. He was only anxious to help. And when Churchill was difficult, he'd, he'd act as an intermediary and try to get Churchill to behave sensibly about things. So she began in a rational way to see him as a, as a, as a benevolent force in Churchill's life. She was embarrassed, I think, that he gave so much and asked so little. Everything he does, you know, he seems to have been with a great gusto and great energy and a determination to succeed against the odds because he came from a rather poor and humble background, but he elevated himself to, you know, a big player in the mainstream of society and the upper level of politics. Churchill was the great leader, but he was the vital advisor to Churchill during the periods when Churchill was still politically quite weak. Sadly, he was not a happy man and his life has great lessons because he achieved everything he set out to achieve and he found it empty in the end. I have great admiration for, for, for the man. I'm, I'm very proud of him and I, and I, I like him very, very much and I'm, I'm very proud to bear his name. In his will, he left money to Churchill College at Cambridge University, which was to open in 1960 and generations of scholars have found Bracken Library to be the focal point of Churchill College, just as Brendan Bracken would have wished. Brendan Bracken's legacy is all around us, in our newspapers, our broadcasting, and in our literature, but most importantly, in his unswerving support for the 20th century's most iconic figure, Winston Churchill, without whose triumph we might all be telling a very different story. Brendan Bracken would have hated this his story being told. He gave instructions there were to be no memorial services, there were to be no biographies, that his papers were to be destroyed after he died, and it took Alex Ailey, his chauffeur, eight days to burn all his papers in the grate at Lord North Street. There were only three people at the crematorium for Bracken's funeral, after which his chauffeur, Alex Ailey, took Brendan Bracken's ashes and scattered them on the Romney marshes behind the sink ports of which his master, Winston Churchill, was then the Lord Warden. I shall die young and be forgotten, was Brendan Bracken's oft-quoted remark. And in that, Winston Churchill's devoted servant, and some would say his secret son, was wrong.